Hello to you, Brian. Wonderful to uh, catch up with you and to hear a little bit about what's going on currently. Um, and fantastic to, to also be able to hear from you and, and hear your wisdom about your life story and foundations for farming. Um, do you want to just briefly um, just tell us about a little bit about yourself, just a few minutes of introduction? Yeah, I'm born in Zimbabwe. My wife, Kath, and five children all born here. Uh, lived here all our lives, been through the whole adventure of, um, you know, the ups and downs in Zimbabwe. And uh, grateful to be here still. And um, yeah, I've had an exciting life. I was born in 1943, just during the Second World War. And my parents, um, yeah, my father was an electrical engineer. And uh, I sort of lived quite a, a privileged early life. Then both my parents died when I was young. So, and I went to stay with my older sister and her wonderful husband uh, and my younger brother, Sam. And, um, and she died when, uh, um, well, my mum died when I was 11 and my dad a few years later, but my sister took us in and it was wonderful. She was much older than we were. So um, anyway, um, after, uh, at the end of school, I, uh, uh, well, firstly, my father was in a, a professional. I had an uncle who was a, an accountant and an uncle who was an architect, and I wanted to be a professional. I was a city dweller, basically. And, uh, and so I never thought I'd be a farmer, but I, and I wanted to be an architect, and I was booked into Cape Town University. So a very prominent uh, tobacco farmer came and asked me and said, um, I'd made lots of runs on a school tour of the country districts in my last year at school. And he said to me um, in cricket, you know, so he said, um, what are you going to do when you leave school? So I said, I, I hope to go to um, Cape Town University to study architecture. So he said, look, I tell you what, what, what are you going to do before you go? So I said, I'll probably get a job at Barber's selling stuff before Christmas and stuff. He said, no, come on the, on the farm. So I went out and it was a wonderful life. And it ended up that he offered um, to teach me how to grow uh, tobacco. And he said it's the fastest way for a young man to get on his feet in the world at that time. And that was in the beginning of 1963, January 63. And 1963. So um, uh, um, then he said to me, if, if you like, come and work for me for six, five or six years, and I'll teach you all I know. And after six years, I'll help you buy your own farm, knowing I was an orphan. And so um, he said, um, but your wage is going to play rugby and cricket for me as my son. So how could I turn <laughs> down? Wonderful. Uh, and, uh, well, yeah, he's a wonderful man. He wasn't a Christian, but he was a great guy. And he really fathered me well. Very bright fellow. He'd been to university. And he said, don't go to university. It's all about thinking. I'll teach you how to think. <laughs> so, so off we went. And um, he, true to his word, he helped me buy my own farm. And I'd married Kath in the meantime. And lovely farmer's daughter, just um, 20 k's up the road. And um, the children started coming along the road. And then, so I worked for him in tobacco for six years and then 14 years on our own. And um, did fairly well, and won a national prize doing it and stuff. But I was a very selfish, ambitious young man and uh, wanting to be, play national cricket and they say lug rugby as well, but I didn't, I had to choose between the two, but anyway, it, what happened is that um, lived this sort of ambitious life, trying to be a chairman of this and that, and, and in the end, um, we got married, and then the children were coming along and getting bigger, and so then I said to Kath, um, sometime in 1978, you know, I said to her, Kath, I, I was such a wild guy, and I had to change, I said, I've got to become really respectable and respectable people go to church. So we went to the local church for respectability. And then um, we were, I was a nominal Anglican and she was a nominal Catholic. And so anyway, we went along to this little church in our farming area and um, it, it was, uh, nobody really knew Jesus at all, at all, but anyway, it was all nominal Christianity. But they made me chairman of the, of the church council when I thought it was really respectable. And then a lady um, in our 
in our church, went to a lay witness meeting in, the, in Chinoy, uh, about 100 kilometers away, and she came back completely changed, and she could see that we weren't born again. And she'd but born again, now you see, and filled with the Spirit. And so she nagged me to have a, a, you know, a, a, a one of these lay witness missions. So eventually I considered and and uh, they came out, some guys came out and shared their testimonies. And Kath and I both gave our lives to the Lord in November 78. And I was still growing tobacco. But now the Lord was going to work on me. So shortly after that, um, we were traveling back from Har Harare in the car. We were 100, 227 kilometers from town in the north towards Kariba, north of Harare. And um, on the radio came a message about how bad tobacco smoking was. And I'd had this thing about it with my children. I didn't want them to smoke and, and, and tobacco. And so uh, my daughter, Diane, said to me, yes, Dad, but why'd you grow tobacco? Well, I was my hypocrisy <laughs> before me. So um, I sort of made excuses. And I said, you know, it's all I've ever learned to do. It's got all these tobacco barns. I've got to pay your school fees and try to sweep it under the carpet. But uh, a short while later, um, as a new Christian, um, I couldn't sleep in the middle of the night, one night on the farm, just could not sleep. And about one o'clock in the morning, I took out my Bible to read, and as a newish Christian, six months old at the time, I think, and um, the reading for the day was from 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which says, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Mm. And suddenly the Holy Spirit came and convicted me, and I knew I was going poison for a lot of people. And I was so convicted, I thought, how can I be glorifying God by growing poison for so many people? And by God's grace, he convicted me, and I made a, a promise in the middle of the night never to grow another leaf of tobacco in my life. And so a, a sort of a peace came over me, and I fell asleep. And then the next morning, I thought, oh, now I've got to tell Kath. And you know, at that stage, we had four ch young children, and uh, we of the five, and then um, I thought she was going to be very security conscious with all the children and conscious and say, oh, no, no, we can't do that. But immediately I said to her in the morning, I promised the Lord I'd never grow another leaf tobacco in my life. She said, yes, let's grow food. <laughs> God will bless us. So we were on the same path right from the beginning. Wonderful. Blessing, great blessing. And so... Uh, so we thought by not growing poison, growing food, God would bless us because we knew Christians, you see. But we didn't realize that the blessing of God was going to be different because he had to sort me out from my selfish ambition and my worldliness and pride. And, and um, you know, I, I know it's a tough thing to say, but the scriptures are really brave and, and straightforward. It says in, in if you read um, in James 3, 13 to 18, it talks about wisdom from above, and it says that a selfish ambition is actually demonic. And mm -hmm. so it's not of God, you know, it's it's all about self and uh, elevation of self and and so on, and materialism comes into it, I suppose, and status and all that. So anyway, it, that had to be sorted out in me. And so we started growing food in maize on a Sandfeld farm because of tobacco like Sandfeld, which doesn't hold water very well. And um, we had a little bit of water for some wheat, so we started with that. And then instead of this blessing, there were two very dry years in our area and our whole nation. But the little rain that came rained all around us and it just didn't come on our farm and we couldn't understand this. But for two years in a row, we had these two terrible droughts and we lost so much money, the bank um, came to us and said, look, you're, you're losing so much money. If you carry on growing um, foodstuffs on the sand felt, we're going to have to close you down. But if you grow tobacco, you're a good tobacco grower, we'll support you. And then they called me to the, the board to see the board of the bank, and I had to stand there before all these very venerated gentlemen and this gruff chairman at the far end saying, what's this nonsense? You're not growing tobacco. Grow tobacco and we can support you. And you so I said, no, no, and I had to look at them and said, no, I've promised God I've never grown a leaf of tobacco in my life. And he was very upset and he's all glowering at me and he says, you're very irresponsible now when we have to, and you've just, when we lost everything. So there's a massive challenge. Was I going to follow what was convenient 
or lose everything for God. And um, it wasn't that I was a very mature person or anything, but it was God's grace in my life to to do that. And um, anyway, so then it was an, the real problem afterwards. I couldn't get a job for some time. All my friends said I was crazy and uh, stupid. My father was angry with me for looking after his daughter. I'd lost all reputation, you know, and, and um, it was quite hard, you know, and losing image and status and so on, and going right to the bottom, couldn't get a job. But I didn't know that God was going to take us the rest of our lives to teach uh, um, God's plan for the poor, those with nothing. Mm. And we went through the pain of failure, the pain of um, a lack of self-worth, lack of hope in a way, for a while. And so we have a sensitivity to that, those people. We can identify with them. We've got a story that touches people who are in that state of brokenness. Mm. And it's the greatest blessing we've ever had because it set the platform for what was to come. And we didn't know that at the time. But um, So eventually, um, I got a job working for a widow who lived in about... Or, 200 k's away on a different soil type and they were growing maize, wheat and soybeans and didn't want to grow tobacco. And uh, this farm was in Matepa Tepa, which is about 145 kilometers north of Harare. And so um, it, this um, farm had been a big farm and a successful farm in the old days. And her husband had been um, ambushed and killed in our um, in our Bush War, Liberation Bush War in Zimbabwe. It started 10 years from 1968, a bit more than that, 66 to about this 1918, 14 years. And so um, that um, he'd been ambushed and killed, and so she'd lost a lot of money. And the, that farm was now on the last legs at the, at the bank. And so I got this job, they fired their manager, and this is my new job now. So I went off to work for her having had two years trying to grow tobacco uh, and uh, food on this tobacco stand. And now, but um, that year, and it's crazy, we made a loss and the bank said one last chance. I thought I was going to get a, a fired, but I didn't get fired. But what, what happened is that we'd been taught in farming as a traditional, it was an art form and plowing was the hallmark of a good farmer. The more evenly you plowed and the deeper you plowed and your tilsons, the way you plowed was an art form and it was a sign of being a good farmer. And it was sacrosanct, basically. But God had to show me that that's the very worst thing you can do. And it's the cause of all the soil loss and the degradation and uh, the problem in the world today, actually. Um, many years later, I've spoken on many platforms in the world and... Um, uh, and, and we've actually lost a hundred uh, in the last 150 years, we lost half the world's topsoil. So it's very serious. And I'll, I'll come back to that later on in the story uh, as I, I rush on, but it's just the beginning part is, is quite important to this issue because um, God was showing us these things. And so um, then I realized that, you know, that the, uh, we'd seen huge erosion on our farm that year and uh, loss of soil and, and, and very hard soil and, and the structure had broken down. And so I, I was desperate and uh, I'd heard about zero tillage, but when I went and asked all the, the experts uh, about it, they said, no, no, we, the Americans brought it here 10 years ago in the early 70s. Now this is the early 80s, 1982, 83. And um, they, we tried it and it doesn't work in the, in the tropics, so don't, don't forget about it. So anyway, um, I, I had a feeling in my heart it was good, but, but they said it was right, not right. But I was desperate. And so then I was reading Romans chapter 1. And it says there between uh, verses 18 and 22, right in the middle of that portion, about verse 20, I think it is. He says, if you look at God's natural creation, you're without excuse. There must be a God. Mm. That means you see his ways as well. So I thought to myself, God's natural creation. And we had some natural creation, some virgin bush on the farm. 
a beautiful tract where the cattle had come down to drink from the hills. And nobody had ever farmed that before. It was just a few cattle wandering down and a few buck and, and wild animals and so on for thousands of years. And so uh, I, it was quite a big tract. And so I went and had a look and I sat down in the ground and I, I capitulated before God and just said, Lord, this is your soil, these are your plants. Will you show me how you grow natural creation? And I sat there just looking, waiting on God and looking at this beautiful uh, grassy woodland, you know. And so um, then I noticed that the leaves fall down on the ground and the grass dies down. And there's a beautiful protective blanket over the earth. And I saw it, when I touched it, it was nice and soft and didn't get too hard. And I carried on looking and I saw there's no soil inversion in natural creation. And I saw that the plants don't die of, of lack of nutrition or uh, disease and pests. God has sustained it thousands of years. So I thought, this is the way you farm in natural creation, Lord. And Jesus says, I only do what my father does. I only say what my father says. So if my father farms like that. Surely I can. And a tiny bit of faith came in my heart to try. And later on, we would learn about the parable of the talents, where it says, if you're faithful little, God will add to us. If you're unfaithful little, he'll take it away from us. Anyway, so I didn't own the farm, and we, we had a thousand hectic program of, of uh, maize, wheat, and soils, and it was failing in the last chance at the bank. And uh, of course, we were plowing deeply, but I took two hectares, and I prayed for wisdom, and we planted maize into wheat straw without any plowing with this wheat, the wheat straw had been sort of spread by the combine harvester. And we planted into it. And I prayed for wisdom how to do that. And everybody laughed at me at the club though, you know, we had this mm -hmm. center was a club at all these um, country clubs. So they, all my friends laughed at me and said, oh, you're wasting your time, you're stupid. And then the academic com community said I was wasting my time, but I was determined to do the small piece of two hectares out of uh, a thousand hectares, 998 hectares still being plowed deeply. But I tried to do it as best I could so it wouldn't fail at the highest standard. And that year, we ended up getting 10, 20 tons from two hectares, which is 10 tons a hectare. Our national average is half a ton a hectare. And it was just God's grace, and it was amazing because of one of the first times that that yield had been achieved in our nation. So it was just immediately God's grace came, and then that gave me encouragement to do 50 hectares the next year. And then that was so good, um, I tried to do it as a high standard, and then 100 hectares the next year, then 200 hectares, then 500 hectares, and then within six years, the whole farm was down to 1,000 hectares. But the amazing thing is that farm had lost under the widow and then in my first year, money for years was going right downhill. But then we turned to God and we were faithful little in two hectares. And that year we made a profit for the first time. And we made a profit ever since. And then that continuing profitability grew to the fact that we bought the farms who were failing around us. And eventually after 12 years, it became three and a half thousand hectares of net cropping area with 1,200, 1,250 hectares of irrigation, a massive farm. And at the time, somebody said it was the second largest privately owned farm in the whole of the region. And so it was just an amazing success. And um, But in the process, I'd noticed how poor the people were across the river from us in the Chueshi, there was a rare river, and then across there was the communal area where the small-scale people were eking a, trying to eke a living, and they were hungry and poor as anything. And God said, this is so appropriate for them. Now, I haven't given it to you for you, but for them. So that began a, a great adventure of going across the river to share with them about how God had taught me. And there was a story behind it, because they were broken, and I could share how I'd been broken. Mm. And you see, and later on I learned 
that if you go to a poor community, and this is just a picture of a poor community in Africa and possibly in India and other places of the world, and you, you go to them and they, they've got a little piece of land and there's a failed crop. It's full of weeds, half the plants are missing, everything's cockeyed and it's a failure. And they're hungry because they're lacking nutrition and food. They're not very well, they're not very strong. They realize they are at the bottom row of the social scale in the world. And they've got no hope, they're in captivity to this poverty. They can't get out of it. So there they are, hopeless, without self-worth, and uh, not well. And if you come to them and say to them, I hear you battling, we've got a good idea for you. They don't hear your second sentence. Their only hope is the begging bowl. And you know, Jesus loved us. The Father loved us where we were as sinners in all our badness, in all our weakness. He loved us where we were. And I've learned to love people where they are. And you meet people where they are. And so if they've got the bigging bowl, people are scornful of that. But that's all they've got they, is, to, is to beg. That's how poor they are. And so when you pitch up there, they they're waiting to share their burden with you. So what I've learned is that on the way towards meeting one of these people, you pray mm. for love for them. And when you arrive, they see you coming in a car and they think you've got some money. So then they come and they say, wow, you know, this guy's got a bit of money if I tell him my problems. But of course, people don't listen, you see. So God said to me, if you want them to hear you, he says in Luke 6.38, as you measure, I'll measure it to you. And so what you have to do is to listen to them first, if you want them to listen to you. So I teach all our guys now in many places, teaching to the poor in the world today. I say, go and say, hi, you guys. You know? And he looks at you and he thinks, oh, he wants to know. So then he starts to pour out his problems. And you listen intently because you want him to listen intently. And you're praying with compassion and you listen. And he tells you all these problems and he tells you his problems. He's trying to make you feel sorry for him, so you give him some money. You just love him where he is. So eventually he's finished. He's got it all off his chest. So then, quite honestly, to this day, we, we don't charge for anything. But in those early days, especially, I had no money. So I would say to them, you know, I don't have much money at all. But I tell you what, I was poor like you once and broken. And, um, you know, God brought me out of poverty and it's quite amazing. Would you like to hear my story? Now, they love storytelling. And you've heard their story. So God measures it back to you hmm. in, their, in their hearts. And God touches them. You see, the, the word of God says in Timothy 2, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, he says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living. So the one who serves God will be fully qualified and equipped for every good work. In the word of God is the answer to every single dilemma on earth. And I've found this in my life of many, many years as a Christian now and a great adventure. And so um, th that's amazing how it, what happens when you when you they listen to the story and that you do we do it very graphically with animation in their sort of milieu. And we draw it all up, the technology on a whiteboard or whatever, a sheet of paper, um, sort of a, any kind of way of communicating it to them. And then um, when we finish the story, we, we say to them, let's have a look at your field now. It's, there it is. And we said, um, now, if you pitched up there and said, I want you to plant into that absolute jungle of weeds and mess with no burning, so that the blanket is there, and no plowing. They would think I'm mad, and I would think I was mad. So now, you know, you've got to break through that. It's an impossibility in their eyes. 
So we said, okay, look, remember, I started with two hectares. Here's your one hectare. Let's go and make a small patch. So we go and get four pigs. We put them in the ground, four meters apart, and then 30 meters down, another four pigs, uh, another two pigs. So there are four pigs. Now there's a, a, a box. We put some white string around that you can see, some thick white string, and it makes a, like a, a box. And then um, I say to them, and then we, we take a piece of newspaper or a piece of fool's cap or something. It's got a, a rectangle in the corner, otherwise it wouldn't get through the printing press. So we make that a set square in the corner and we, we show them how to make a dead square, you know. And so they, you're teaching them standards. And so then, um, and also I'd forgotten to say to you in the story, um, I noticed that there's a technology I'm just going back a few clicks now, but we have this simple technology of no plowing and no burning and mulch on the surface and, you know, and so on, so that it's a wonderful blessing. But the great challenge I've found is getting people to translate theory into practice. Until mm -hmm. that thing is practiced, it doesn't mean anything. And that's the problem amongst the Africa and the many poor people in, in this world today. And so how do we, and then I said to the Lord, how do you translate that into practice? And that's when he told me, you've got to get into their hearts, not just their heads. And you got to, and he said, you got, as I measure, as you measure, I'll measure to you, you go and listen to them. So that's how I learned that. So then I try to do this in, in 58 stations all over Zimbabwe when I was asked to teach them the cooperatives because we came out of a Marxist-Leninist sort of doctrinaire bush war. And the hallmark of, of communism or is collectivism. So they put the, these ex-combatants into um, cooperatives of 50 families on a nice farm. And so, and they were just failing terribly. And so we'd been asked to teach them to them. And every time in 58 places, while we supervised them, they would do very well and uh, go up from half a hectare or quarter of a hectare, right up to eight hectares, uh, eight tons a hectare rather, instead of half a ton. And so, um, but every time we left them after teaching them for a bit, it would collapse backwards. And so I said, Lord, how do we translate this theory into practice so they do it? And that's when he taught me about this. So I, I had to just say that, so then it all comes into the story, you see. So when, when I'm telling them the story now, I've just told them the story completely about the technology and the management system and how to make a profit, because that's how you make a profit. Because I said to God, Lord, Africa's poor and it's got 30% of the world's natural resources and only at that time, 2% of the world's GDP. It's about 3% now with all this discovery of oil and stuff everywhere. But um, it's, it's very dismal and um, we're importing food in Africa where we've got the greatest resource of soil and rainfall on earth. So it's crazy. So there's a dilemma of this poverty. And, and I said to him, Lord, why are we so poor? And he said, there are two main things. The first thing is, is unfaithfulness, the power of the talents. If we, we've got all this lovely land and we've been unfaithful with it, so God can't give to us. He has to take away from us. And the China is here. It's just putting infrastructure into Africa and getting paid in land and mineral rights. And it's, it's very, very dangerous. And of course, the colonial era was a, preceded that as well. But it's a very dangerous situation now. And you see, God is a holy, just God. He, he can't overturn his or ignore his edicts. And he says, if you're faithful little, I'll add to you. If you're unfaithful little, I'll have to take it away from you. So <laughs> he's a holy, just God. It's got to happen. So the key is to teach faithfulness into the continent with all the resources we've got. And everybody else is just uh, mining our resources and taking it to their countries and finishing it there. And here we are languishing. Everybody blames colonialism, but basically there's a root cause behind that is, is God is allowing it because of unfaithfulness. So we have to teach faithfulness into the continent. And that's a hard thing to say, but, you know, God's way is, it says in Isaiah 50, Five verse eight, he says, "My ways are higher and different to your ways." Mm. Often not logical. So, 
I might be to, speaking about some radical stuff to you all, but uh, God's way are, always are different. And so, anyway, so um, and so then, how do you change a, a, a nation? You actually change it from the bottom, not the top. You see, the intellectuals and the power mongers are too proud and too selfish to hear um, God's simple ways. And when Jesus came, he refused to go to the kings, the governors, the rich, the powerful, the educated. He knows they're too proud to cement in the building blocks, foundational building blocks, into a culture group, into a nation. So he chooses 12 relatively poor and uneducated men to change the world. Hmm. It's just a different way. It's an upside down kingdom. And so I know that that's the root of changing Africa is from the bottom. <laughs> and it's amazing because you see, his ways are so different, it's not logical. And God has created it not logically, his ways not logically, because, you know, you have to receive it by faith. You know, he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. My logic says, but Lord, I'm strengthening my enemy to kill me. He says, no, 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 no. You do the opposite of your logic, my friend. You go and love him. Mm. If he's thirsty, you give him something to drink. If you go, he's hungry, you give him something. And you, because I'm the one who changes hearts, not you, not your argumentation, not your opposition, not your intellect. I change hearts. And you love your enemy, then I come and the battle is mine. Then he says, if somebody takes your cloak, you give me a tunic as well. Oh, but I'm, I'm rewarding a thief to, to be a worse thief, Lord. I'm giving a reward. He says, no, no, no. Trust me, you know, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust me with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge me in all your ways, and I'll make your path straight. And his ways are different. Do we really say, what are your different ways, Lord, for all the problems in this world? We are an understanding. It's all logic and reason and cut and thrust and stuff. So, no, no, no. So, you know, we have to learn these things. And he, the thing about with me is that I've got no education. I didn't go to university. But he says, I choose the weak to shame the strong and the foolish to confound the wise. That's in 1 Corinthians 1, about 26 to 45. It's a beautiful portion of how he humbles us down. And, and I, 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 I say intellectual achievement in academia is, is fine if it comes with a humble heart. And then the selfish heart. And so um, it's not a problem in that, but it's a state of don't lean on your own understanding. And he finishes, uh, you know, in, in verse 7 of Proverbs 3, he says, don't be wise in your own eyes. <laughs> it's it's uh, amazing how God's wisdom is so different. So he, he wants us to depend on him for everything. Mm. And then he, he says in the beginning of Isaiah 20 and in uh, 30, uh, Isaiah 30, and in the beginning of chapter 31 as well, he repeats it twice. He says, do not make plans are not my plans. I could tell you the context of the Syrians coming and so on, and they, they go and make a tra treaty with Egypt. He says, no, man, I'm your defender. What are you doing making a treaty with Egypt? Mm -hmm. He says, you know, and don't make plans are not my plans. And then the scripture we love, which is in Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. They're good plans. Then he says, if you seek me, you'll find me. You'll find me if you seek me with all of your heart. So we just got to say, Lord, I'm going to be like the important widow. I'm not going to let you go until you, mm. you give me the answer. Or like Jacob, it didn't let the angel go all night until he got the blessing. He wants the tenacity. I want to hear what you say, Lord. I don't want to hear the words world says or my flesh says or my experience says. What do you say, Lord? Because yours ways are different. And that's the power. <laughs> if the, the church knew the power they had, popping child like Jesus says, be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not the worst kids. <laughs> and but a worst kid can be a, like a child. <laughs> and boy, he can go really far. So it's just God's different way. So Anyway, I've taken a long time about this, but these are values I have to just share because it's so exciting. If you're battling anywhere with problems and you're down and out, 
I've noticed that often before a great move of God, if you turn to God with all your heart, because there he is, like the importunate, at least sorry, the prodigal son, he's waiting for you to return to him with open arms, and he wants to just hug you as you return to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've messed up. I've just come back in humility to you. And he just loves us, and he favors us, and he helps us. So, you know, you, and then you just have to say, what's your way, Lord? And he says, look, my friend, just take the little you have in your life left and put an altar for me and ask me to help you to be faithful with it. And I'll add to that faithfulness. And I'll tell you what, it's exponential. Because what happened from going across to Jewishy, I started by just going across to the people there and I oh, had to teach me that ancestral worship and witchcraft is a big problem. And it's actually a satanic root. And the only thing that's overcome that thing that's paralyzed Africa is the finished work of Jesus at the cross. Because if Satan's the, the, the author of that, there's no army, there's no philosophy, there's no president, there's no politics, there's no, nothing that can defeat it, that power. But the finished work of Jesus at the cross, where he defeated the power of sin and death, the power of Satan and his demons. So it's got to go forward with the the, the, with Christ Jesus because you see the rule of this world is too clever for everybody and the only one who's overcome him is Jesus so you know it's so practical if you're a, a whiskered industrialist and you're battling a bit my friend <laughs> you, you, you just have to humble yourself in the mighty hand of God and he'll mm -hmm. humble yourself in the mighty hand of God and say Lord I, I'm battling will you help me mm -hmm. If you do that, I'll exhort you in due time. Because you see, I had died to my selfishness and my ambition. Wanting image, wanting stuff, recognition. And I humbled myself. He humbled me. He says, allow me to humble you under my, hand, my mighty hand. And I'll exhort you and use you in due time. And I found in my life when he wants to treat me, he wants to use me to break into another horizon of um, kingdom advance, he puts me through a rough patch for a while. And I've learned to get quite excited in him now because I know it's proceeding, it's humbling me down for a massive advance in kingdom effectiveness for the world in, in through our lives. So these are things that are so encouraging for us because oh, it's, it, God's ways are different and he loves us so much. And you know, those he loves, he rebukes and chastens. It's part of his love, my friends, if you're back then. But all he wants you to do is say, I want to return back to you, Lord. I want to do things your way and not my way. And he, if the church knew this, we would truly be sought and light and head not the tail. So anyway, getting back to this little piece of ground. And, and so they listen to the story, you see, in their context of understanding. And then you go to this little patch and it's beautifully measured now. Beautiful. You're accurate. You're teaching them standards, you see. Because God said to me, when I went to him and said, how do you make a profit, Lord? And he said, there are three things to make a profit. Because you must make a profit to come out of poverty. In Africa, we're losing money at every level, from individual to um, corporations to governments to continent. It's all losing money. And so our expenditure exceeds our income. So you've got to reverse that process. And so how do you make a profit, Lord? So he says, there are three things you must do. Do everything you do must be done on time. Everything you do must be done at a decent standard that glorifies me. And everything you do must be done without wastage. If you do those three things, in very we make a profit. In Africa, we're always late. Our standards are the lowest in the world. We waste soil, water, time, energy, labor, um, opportunity, etc. on and on it goes. And so we've got to reverse those ethics and those principles and those practices in a continent, you know. Mm. And so it's, it's important in the world, the property you see in the world. So, um, yeah, so, uh, and then you see then, there you have a, a theory of technology, no plowing, it's as simple as it is. Simplicity is God's genius, by the way and a simple management system. But they're both theories until you put them to practice. And that's when I said, Lord, how do you 
translate theory into practice. So I said, you got these poor folk, you tell them the story. And so I'll get back to the story now. So there, the, you say to the family, the husband, wife, and a couple of children, and um, they've got a hoe. And say, line up four of you in this four meters and chop down the weeds at ground level, chop, chop, chop in straight lines. And then the, the widowed aunt or the, or the grandmother who's old goes behind, spreading it out into being a, a beautiful carpet, even carpet. So off you go. If, you, if you've ever seen a combine harvester going through wheat, it's like two walls on either side of the freshly cut field of the combine harvester going through. It's like a box. And there's chaos around there. And there's this, this beautiful carpet with an exactly measured box of um, in that little area. And you say, come and have a look at this. You say, doesn't it look beautiful? Now, I've never seen aesthetic beauty and, and, and precision. And we say, you know, in, in Ezekiel 40 to 46, it was all about building the, rebuilding the lost temple. And when Ezekiel was shown this, there was an angel with a measuring cord and a, 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 and a measuring rod. And everything was exactly measured and squared up and everything. And God's a God of order and precision. And so we say, you know, when you do it beautifully like this, this is glorifying God. And the visual impact is so important that we've learned. So they, they look at this and it's, you're praying for the Holy Spirit to take it into the understanding. And you see, they love storytelling, so it's part of the story now. And they're feeling it because you're with them and they've just done it, you see, in about an hour. And... Um, and then you say to them, well, you know, it's two months before the rain comes, you're on time. This is the being done at the highest standard in the world. No machine could do it better than this. You're at standard. You know, you're not wasting anything anymore now. You've chopped down that grass and it's not pumping water out the soil or nutrients. That layer of mulch over the sea, God's blanket, we call it, is now stopping evaporation. The beetles and worms and ants that God's put in there are doing its work to take it into the ground and cause little channels there for when the rain comes, the blanket cushions the raindrop and doesn't pound it and, and make it hard and it percolates and goes down these little channels and you capture all the moisture that you get. You're not wasting anything and you're glorifying God. Mm. You're very high standard and you're on time. You're going to make a profit. And you see, I said, if God loves you the same as me. No, no difference. He loves us both the same. If you do it with little, like me, I did with little, it'll, he'll do it for you. And you, you animate this into their hearts, you see, and, you, and then they think about it and they see this. We've done it. And you know what happens? A little bit of hope comes in their hearts. First time ever. Because the Holy Spirit's involved, remember. Hmm. And then, you know what follows a bit of hope? It's a bit of joy. Because I was otherwise complaining and, and sorry for oneself. A little bit of joy comes in. You know, Nehemiah built those walls in 52 days. A construction engineering miracle. Hung the gates, everything. Rubble out the way. Incredible achievement. First, he unified and focused the people. But he said at the end, in I think it's Nehemiah 8.10. He says, our joy was our strength. So from love to sharing a vision, to bring hope, brings joy, brings strength. And they got stuck in with that strength and joy. And the whole land is prepared before the rains come. And a miracle has happened on earth. Mm. James the world. You see how God says, I... Don't despise a day of small things. <laughs> it's all in the scriptures, my friends. Every single thing. And all this time. So I pray that you hear this to help you wherever you are. But also, you know, if you fail a little, God adds to you. So it grew to two, three, three and a half thousand hectares. And I'll go and share with one farmer and the second one because the witchcraft was a natural. And then to the local school. And I start with one little area across the river. 
And that has now reached into our nation thoroughly in a new Fum Fuzza program, which is another story I might have time for. But, and then God said to me one day, I want this to go far and wide. And he said, but anyway, I didn't know that. But I went up to pray in, on this lovely high ground we had in our farm, beautiful range, and down to the river. And, the, and I went up halfway up this quite big gormal uh, mount. And I, I was praying and I was looking, and in front of me was 17 kilometers of green of this lush, amazing farm. And then across the river was brown, no trees, poverty, hunger. And I was looking out there and God said, you see the harvest is white for harvest. I want you to send out many workers into that harvest field to share the vision and knowledge I've given you in many language and culture groups. I said, Lord, how can I do that? I'm just a woman broken down manager on a farm working for a widow. And he said, no, my friend, um, I want you to go and make Antioch bases like they did after there was a persecution and in the north in Antioch. And he said, I want you to teach the vision and knowledge I've shared with you and you train trainers to go to the poor where they are. And I said, Lord, how can I do that? I'm not going to have money. He said, make one and I'll multiply it. I've taught you faithful a little. So I made one in the farm. To cut the long story short, we've now gone into 40 nations in Africa and there are many stations emerging in Africa now where we teach people to go and share vision with the poor. And we have teams in all five continents. We, Australia haven't really got moving, but they have keen to go. But there's two in India, um, one in, in Europe, in Austria. Romania is going to start, I think, and then definitely Holland wants to, and they're reaching out into the Dutch ex-colonies as well. And um, and then there's a beautiful one in, in, in England where we study um, how to apply these principles in the first world, which is another story. And then we have one in Canada, one in Mexico, one in Alabama. A team of ours have just come back from South America. We were talking to five nations to sit, preparing to set up stations there. And we've been invited to the Far East. Uh, we've had invitations from Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, China, sort of coming along the line. But I don't worry about it because we've gone into all these places with very little money and no plans of our own. Never make a plan. Wait for God. And it's all come from sharing vision and some, it goes forward and then somebody calls you. And literally, I've never had enough money to get across the border hardly here. <laughs> but God's made sure of that because, uh, but if they fly us there and accommodate us, we go and share. And we charge nothing. We bless them. And on it goes, in God's time. And so I don't worry about plans. It was just calls. And, I, and South America called for a long time, but I just waited. And then materialized. In God's time, and we can't do everything at once, but on it goes. So here, a broken down farmer has just got a, and God has sent the most amazing people. People completely dead to self. And you know, I teach everybody now that, you know, we can't change this world or any institution or any nation on science and technology and politics and economics applied and the social sciences and stuff and industry and stuff. Technology, technology. If it's, if we can, you know, we can put a man on, or on the moon and we can put a, a machine on the other side of Mars or something now. And so, you know, it, it's a huge achievement and we've got artificial intelligence coming and all this sophistication in the world. But look at the state of our moral index. It's just going to, down the tubes. Look at the state of environment and stuff. And it's just, if you rebuild on poor character with science and technology and so on, it's a disaster. And so we, we point to Jesus, Jesus' mm -hmm. character, because we call ourselves foundations for farming. 
because it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 11, there's one, uh, no other foundation than the one that's already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Hmm. And you see, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the fulcrum of truth in this world. And remember, he's the co-creator of this universe, with his Father. And he's got all authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. So, you know, we just cast ourselves upon Jesus. And, and so it's so important that we put him first and, and um, obey every, you know, everything. It's gone forward with no money. And he's done it. And you see his character, we use the name foundations for farming, plural, because it's in Isaiah 58, which is our guiding scripture, which is all about the true fast and the false fast and the true fast. False fast is you fast and pray with a selfish heart, God won't hear you. Hmm. Pointing to the root cause of every problem on earth, it's selfishness, wars, crimes, violence, theft, corruption, immorality, self-gratification, pride, self-elevation, jealousy, envy, murder, everything has got a root of selfishness. That's the fall of man, what we did through Adam and Eve at the, the cross. We can do our own thing, we can be our own God. No, he says, no, no, no. Surrender to me everything. Mm. Do it my way. Be like a child. Trust me. Mm. And he's right, you see. And so, it's incredible. So it's so, so powerful. So um, we call ourselves foundations because we believe that it's not just Jesus, it's his character. That's we've got to build on the solid character. And you know, this is just my last picture because it's well, I better get going. And so I promised my son I'd do. And there he is in the background. <laughs> I'm going to go, buddy. So, um, you know, I just want to share this one thing with you. There was an in heaven, the father, and he said to his son, you know, I'm a holy, just God. I'm just uh, sort of paraphrasing it. And imagination is a gift from God. He says to his son, you know, I'm a holy, just God. I can't have sin in my presence. I can't have fellowship with all these people I've, I've, I've created down there. I want to send, I want to make a plan. I want you to go down to be a man on earth with a mission. So his son, in obedience to his father, descends in humility from the splendor of heaven, millions of angels around him, to be a man, born as a helpless little baby in a cattle trough, humility of the greatest order. Mm. Then he grows up and lives a sinless life, the only one who's ever never sinned, the only one you can pay for us in the whole of history. We've all sinned, so we can't die for each other. There's only one who can pay for us. Confucius can't. Buddha can't. Muhammad can't. They've all sinned. Everyone. So there's only one hope. Only one sinless person who's ever lived was Jesus. So he comes, he lives a sinless life. At the end of, end of his life, he owns nothing. And then he goes and he empties himself in obedience to his father. And he's, he's spoken the truth and they don't like it. And I want to kill him. And he is he's, he's arrested. He's so barely he's had his bird pulled out and everything. He's so barely beaten. He's scorned and spat upon. Beaten so badly he couldn't be recognized. Then he goes and he is stretched out on the cross and he dies an excruciatingly painful death. And, you know, he dies to pay for us and take our punishment on him. And then he rises again to give us hope because we're going to rise again with him one day. But you look at his character. He's the most humble, unselfish, faithful person that's ever lived. He lived did exactly what his father said unto death. Mm. And that's the character of Christ. And that's why we call ourselves foundations for farming. It's foundation. We've just been called to do foundations for mining. Wow. It's an amazing story. So I've got other stories, I'm afraid, my brother. But this is the core of the gospel, and it's all glory to Jesus. We've gone forward with no money. 
But you see, it all started way back in about May of 1979. Yeah, he said, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Mm. Uh, that is, a, if you concentrate on that, it does away with your pride and your, it does something about your mo own motives. Do everything to the glory of God. No matter what you do, a child doing his homework, do it to the glory of God. Little things, everything. So yeah. it's so <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, Thanks so much for that, Brian. That was just, I was just you know, listening with awe. That was just amazing what God, the journey that God is taking on. So I just want to thank you so much for giving us time and your wisdom. Um, amen to all that.